Hello, hello, hello. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D4, D&D Deep Dive. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons, and we theory graphed about them, we crunch numbers, in hopes to not tell you the right way or the best way even to play a particular character, but to explore one potential way to play a character in the hopes of creating something that is both very fun, but also really powerful to play in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the game itself, then welcome home this is where you belong and i'm really happy that you're here so thanks for being here my name's colby and i'll be your host before we jump in really quick just a reminder if you would like to have a written step-by-step -step guide for how to recreate the character that i do on the show today as well as access to my library of write-ups that i create for just about every character that I do, feel free to click the join button down there. If you're on like a laptop or a desktop computer on mobile, it's a little more complicated. I don't think the join button shows up by default. For $2 a month, you'd get access to that library. And more importantly, I think for most of my supporters, it's just a great way to support the channel, help me create more and better content. So thank you very much to all of my channel members and also to everybody else Thank you for being here as well. Just liking and subscribing and commenting and, and watching the video, frankly, is a great way to support me. So thanks. I'm really excited for today's build because Bladesinger, right? Ah, uh, Bladesingers. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. <laughs> I talk a lot on this channel about how the monk is my favorite class, at least conceptually, thematically. But I think still to date, the most fun I've ever had with a character in game was playing my very first blade singer, Anya, who coincidentally you can see briefly in action if you click on that little card up there on our actual play channel. Um, we did a one shot a few weeks ago that uh, gave me a chance to bring back that beloved character of mine for, for one glorious session. And it was a lot of fun. But anyway, judging by the fact that two of my three most popular videos currently anyway are both both, at least in part, uh, blade singers. I think it's safe to say that the majority of you tend to agree about the fun level of this particular subclass. Why is it that we love Gish characters so much? What is it about the combination of martial skill and spell casting combined in a single character that just makes them so dang alluring? I'm not sure if I know the answer, honestly but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Anyway, the last time I included Bladesinger in a build, which was, I believe, the Eldritch Blade Master there, and for the record, I've only done Bladesinger in three of my 78 videos so far. I try not to overdo it. I teased that I wanted to try my hand at building a Bladesinger tank one day. They have so many great ways to increase their armor class that trying to turn them into a character who is not only spinning and slashing among their enemies, but is intentionally trying to draw their fire in an attempt to protect their allies, keep them safe, would be a really fun and powerful, if slightly different way than we typically think about this amazing subclass. So that is what we're going to do today. But a word of warning, this is going to be a very different version of a blade singer than anything I've done before. In fact, we're not even gonna have any blades that are actually singing. <laughs> See, here's the thing with tank builds. As I say, with almost every tank build I do, but also feel obligated to repeat for any new viewers who are watching, to be a good tank or, you know, a protector, a character who's trying to defend and protect their allies, you have to be more than just hard to kill, right? The most important aspect, in my opinion, of tanking is what we call the taunt sometimes, or finding ways to discourage your enemies from attacking your allies and attacking you instead. Just being hard to kill doesn't really do much to protect your squishier friends, right? And if you're not giving your DMs baddies a reason to go for you instead of the vulnerable rogue or wizard in your party, or at the very least making it harder for them to hit your friends, then you're really not doing your job. So tank builds, all tank builds, I think, need to have an easy to use, resource free, ideally, so that you can use it every turn, way to inflict some form of the enemy has disadvantage if they attack anyone but you mechanic, which is about as close as we get to a taunt in D&D like we often see in 
group-based role-playing video games, right? Where the enemy is like forced to attack you. They don't have any choice. There's nothing like that in D&D 5th edition. I think that's a good thing for the record. And there's also nothing like that inherently in the Bladesinger subclass. So that means that we're going to have to look elsewhere for our taunt. The two best options, in my opinion, are the Cavalier Fighter and the Armorer Artificer, both of which get that little debuff when they hit an enemy. Ancestral Guardian Barbarians do too, but you can't cast spells while raging, so meh. On the one hand, fighters do bring some nice benefits to the table. A great fighting style, action surge, a little self-heal, but Artificers, you know, it's actually interesting because Every time I do a Bladesinger video, I get a ton of comments from people who say, hey, you should go three levels of Artificer, and then you can attack with Intelligence. But I've always shied away from going that route because, frankly, as great as being a little more sad would be a single ability score dependent as opposed to mad multi-ability score dependent, you are still, as a Bladesinger, going to want a high dexterity too. Dexterity increases your armor class, and not just while blade singing, but all the time. It increases, of course, your dexterity saving throws, your initiative, among other things, all of which are very important. So we would want a high dexterity score anyway. And delaying all of our very important blade singer features for three levels, just so we could attack with intelligence, has never seemed worth it to me until now since getting a taunt that give disadvantage to enemies who attack anyone but you feature is so paramount to this version of the Bladesinger. Regardless, I do think you could make fighter work if you really wanted, but I think for us, Artificer is going to work out better. And I'll get into more of the details as to why I think so as we go along. And so, I'm very excited to present episode 79, the Blade Singer Tank. A big thanks, as always, to my friend Randall Hampton for this fantastic artwork that he's done for this piece. I feel like he just gets better every single episode, and I absolutely love the concept that he came up with for this character. So big kudos to Randall, and if you're interested in following him or asking him to commission a piece for your own character in game. I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to follow and get a hold of him. Also, really quick, before we get started on the build, I do want to give a shout out to the sponsor for the video this week, a new app for mobile devices called Dungeon Weather. I don't know about you guys, but I am the kind of person who basically checks the weather every single morning before I head out the door. I just want to know how to dress, mostly, right? What to expect. Well, let me tell you about this awesome little app called Dungeon Weather that is here to bring a little more D&D into your life, even in those small check the weather moments and thus put a smile on your face. Dungeon Weather does everything that a typical weather app would do, uh, giving you current temperature, weather forecasts, broken down by hour, day, searchable by city, etc., etc. But along with all of that useful info, you get this little animated D&D themed scene that plays every single time you open the app to check the weather. You've got your little hero, and you can choose from a selection of several different ones or have it automatically cycle through them. The weather that shows up on the little animated scene will be accurate to the location that you're searching, including like a starry night, rain, storm, snow, sunny skies, fog, even lightning. Your character in the scene is always doing something different. They might be resting, they might be kind of patrolling, or every once in a while, they're gonna have a fight. And when that happens, you get to roll your dice to try and defeat them, and of course you get to choose what your d20 looks like, and you can choose between lots of different monster types, or again, have them cycle through automatically. Now, the app is available on Google Play today. It's coming soon to iOS. They are adding new content all of the time. It's a subscription model to get the app, but it's very, very affordable, and you can actually do a free trial if you wanna just check it out and test it, see if you like it. But if you do decide to subscribe, just enter the promo code D4 when you do so, and you'll get 20% off. And that is absolutely worth it for a little extra D&D in your day, wouldn't you say? I will put the link in the video description to the app in the Google Play Store, so please check it out. And big thanks to Dungeon Weather. I think it's a fantastic app. Let's jump into the build. All right, at level one, for our starting class, I think if we're going to take Artificer levels at all, we might as well start off with them. We get Constitution Saving Throw Proficiency, which is fabulous, of course, for our concentration checks, among other things, and that's going 
going to be very important for us as a spellcaster. Also, again, in my mind, you're not a tank if you can't protect your allies with a taunt-like debuff on your enemies, so getting that as soon as possible is really priority number one. But there are a lot of additional benefits that we get from Artificer, as I mentioned. So yeah, when we first meet our hero, I think they're a bit of a tinkerer. They have an ability that they've honed, whether innate or learned, to infuse their creations with a spark of magic. I kind of imagine them like playing with toys as a child and, and maybe a favorite toy would always be imbued with some magical ability to protect their other toy allies from the evil monster toys. And our character aspires to be that same kind of hero, one who uses their power to protect others. And they want more of it so they can do a better job at protecting. Why do they feel this need so strongly? I'm not sure, actually. I'd like to know what story you would give this character. As for our race, I am going to recommend Variant Human for this build. That's Variant Human two weeks in a row, which I haven't done for a very long time, actually. So yes, there is a feat that's really pretty important for this build, and I want to get it early, but I will say that I think Mountain Dwarf also works really well here for the plus two to two stats that they get, as well as you know, poison resistance and other things. And there are plenty of other worthy considerations as well. Warforged, if you can play with Eberron, is a plus one to AC, among other things. The race I wanted to use here more than anything actually was a turtle. I I wanted to use turtle so bad, I, I wrote my whole outline up originally with turtle in mind, and it was humming along nicely, but then I realized that it probably wasn't going to work how I envisioned it at most tables, I don't think. Not for a tank build, anyway. I think there is a Bladesinger build with a turtle that takes three levels in Artificer, but probably goes Battlesmith, but it's not really a tank build, and for reasons that I'll get into later, I just think it's a little problematic the way that I envision this working. But you might disagree, and you might be able to convince your DM to let it work at your table, in which case, a turtle would be a worthy consideration, I think. But as for the free feat that we would get as a variant human, I want to go dual wielder. It's going to be pretty important for this build. Again, we'll get into some of the reasons why a little bit later, but for now, just know that if we dual wield weapons for two weapon fighting, they don't have to be light weapons now with this feat like they do for everyone else. And when we're wielding a weapon in each hand, we get a plus one to our armor class. So that's a nice little bump to our AC. As for our ability scores, I'm going to assume as always that we're using the point by method and recommend that we take a 15 in dexterity and, and a plus one there, a 15 in intelligence and a plus one there. So we've got 16 in both and then a 14 constitution. The reason that I wanted to go variant human here over custom lineage for the free feat is because I don't plan on taking any half feats that bump either our dexterity or our intelligence, and we want both our dexterity and our intelligence to be high, so starting with a 16 in each is much better than a 17 in one and a 15 in the other, which is what would have happened had we gone custom lineage. Anyway, as for equipment, I would say just take fairly standard stuff here. We're going to want light armor later, but for now we might as well get the better armor class we'd have with scale mail, so take some scale mail, and as for weapons, even though we can technically dual wield long swords or something thanks to our dual wielder feet we only have simple weapon proficiency as an artificer so the best we can do for now is d6 weapons so grab a couple of spears or hand axes or something like that don't worry we'll have d8 weapons soon and then as an artificer at level one we get magical tinkering which lets us touch a tiny non-magical object and imbue it with the spark of magic causing it to do fun and potentially useful things like emit light or a recorded message or even an odor or a sound. I'm curious to know what the funniest or coolest thing you've ever seen done with magical tinkering is. Inquiring minds want to know. And then of course we get spells. As an artificer we get some cantrips, we get some first level spells. There are many good ones to choose from of course, but I think for me Thorn Whip is the one cantrip I'd make sure to grab. It lets you reach out to an enemy within 30 feet and do a little damage, but then pull them towards you if you hit them with a spell attack. This can be a really nice way to get enemies closer to you and away from your friends, letting your allies potentially retreat without taking an opportunity attack, for example. And again, even though there's almost no you must attack me mechanic in D&D 5e, in my experience, and I'm guessing most of yours too, if a melee enemy is only in range of you and nobody else, 
they're usually going to try to attack you. So just being the closest available target is very often the best way to ensure that you are getting attacked and not your friends, right? I would also be sure to grab as a first level spell absorb elements here as that will let you as a reaction have the damage of incoming elemental damage so fire ice poison lightning acid and then you also get to add a d6 of that same damage type to the next melee attack you make but i mean is it me or the vast majority of the times when you take elemental damage from an enemy they tend to be resistant or even immune to that same type of damage. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Anyway, the spell's great for survivability. I would also grab Cure Wounds, I think. You know, as someone who's interested in protecting your friends, it just seems right to be able to heal them and bring them back from unconscious, especially if they go down. Like most tanks, we're not going to be super focused on damage all that much, so filling the role of like a triage backup healer is a really great idea, I think, and a natural fit. The only other spell I'll mention here is Fairy fire. It doesn't necessarily or at least not directly help us tank or protect any better, but I do think it's the best concentration spell we get access to at level 1 and it's really quite good letting you cover potentially several enemies with a glowing light if they fail a dexterity saving throw and then give you and your allies advantage on all attacks against those enemies for a minute. I think it would be my go-to concentration spell for quite a while on this character actually. You know, I suppose if the best defense is a good offense, then you're sort of indirectly helping to protect your allies with this spell by helping your party take out the enemies more quickly. At level 2, we get my favorite Artificer ability, Infuse Item. Infuse Item lets us take two non-magical items and infuse them, making them magical, choosing from a list of infusions that are filled with lots of cool and fun and powerful options. For this build, I think I probably keep it fairly straightforward and maybe a little boring. I know I like numbers, what can I say? But I'd probably go Enhanced Defense for sure, which lets you add a plus one to the AC of a suit of armor or a shield, and then I think I'd take Enhanced Weapon, which lets you turn a mundane weapon into a plus one weapon. We care a little less about the bump this will bring to our damage and more about the increased likelihood that this is going to give us to hit our enemies, as hitting our enemies will be very important for this build if we want to build the best tank that we can, because at level three we get our Artificer Specialist, our subclass, and we are of course going with Armorer. So let's talk about the Armorer features that we get and then discuss our motives a little more in depth. First up, as an armorer, we get proficiency with heavy armor and smith's tools. Feel free to wear some heavy armor for now, I suppose, if you want, but be warned that we're not going to be doing so after level four, so I wouldn't spend a lot of money on this. Then we get the arcane armor feature, which tells us that as an action, we can turn one suit of armor into our arcane armor, which gives us the following benefits. We can ignore strength requirements of the armor if it has one, hence the heavy armor potentially being attractive for a couple of levels. You can use the armor as a spellcasting focus for your artificer spells only. It attaches to you and can't be removed against your will, and you can put it on or take it off with just a single action. But then we get to choose the model for our arcane armor. We choose between either guardian or infiltrator. I did have a ton of fun doing an infiltrator build uh, here if you haven't seen that one but we of course are going with the guardian model here with guardian we get a couple of great features first up defensive field which lets us proficiency bonus times per day and with a bonus action gain temporary hit points equal to our artificer level that would only mean a total of six per day currently not a ton but we'll take it more importantly i think for us we get thunder gauntlets with thunder gauntlets each of our armors gauntlets or gloves right count as a simple melee weapon so long as we're not holding anything in it and each does 1d8 damage on a hit also amazingly if we make attacks with the thunder gauntlets we can use our intelligence modifier for our plus to hit and plus to damage which is really cool and then finally and most importantly a creature hit by the gauntlet has disadvantage on attacks against anyone other than you until your next turn as they emit a distracting pulse when that enemy attacks somebody else and thus we have our soft taunt right okay so this is why we wanted the dual wielder feet. These gauntlets, though we have two of them, one on each hand, they are not listed as light weapons, just simple weapons. Thus, if we wanted to attack with each of them on our turn, one with an action and the other with a bonus action, we'd need to have the dual wielder feet. 
Now, do we want to attack with both of them on our turn? I would say most of the time, absolutely. More damage is nice, sure, but more important for us, of course, is that this would give us two opportunities to impose that disadvantage if they attack anyone but you, debuff, on our enemies, and thus help protect our allies. Add to that the fact that the feat raises our armor class by one, as we've mentioned, and it just makes it absolutely perfect for this character. Now, does this feel like a blade singer to you? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not at first class, but I think we can get there. So hold on for a minute and we'll discuss that in a couple of levels. Oh, and by the way, I think I'll just mention here quickly, this is why I ended up deciding not to go turtle. We're told that turtles gain no benefit from wearing armor. Now, this might only mean that they gain no benefit to their armor class from wearing armor. It doesn't say that they can't wear armor. So I suppose in theory, you could still put the armor on and use the thunder gauntlets if your DM allowed it. And admittedly, the image of a punching turtle is pretty cool. I guess I'm just assuming that many tables wouldn't allow them to benefit from the arcane armor in any way. If that's not the case at your table and you wanna roll turtle, I would say go for it. You'd follow the build almost exactly as, I, as I'm as i going to be laying it out, but you'd then just need to take the dual wielder feat as your first feat, since we don't get a free one, right? If you wanted to punch with both fists anyway. And you could mostly ignore your dexterity score in favor of a higher constitution score, so your survivability would actually probably increase just a little bit going the turtle route. One last thing, also as an Artificer 3, we get the right tool for the job feature. Just lets us create some thieves tools or artisan tools with an hour of work for those rare times when you really need a certain set of tools but don't have them. At level four, our character undergoes a little change. For me, I almost see this as like a natural progression in their development. They've had this pseudo-magical, pseudo-scientific knack for a long time now, but the magical, arcane nature of what they do is now flowering into something more fully developed. I guess they're going through D&D puberty? I don't know. Maybe it's just innate, though that feels a little more sorcerer to me, so I guess I would say that their desire to increase their own ability to protect their friends has led them to study tomes of knowledge, lore, and magic. They want to take this spark that's within them and enhance it into a full-blown flame of arcane power. So as much as I'd love to get that ability score increased by going Artificer 4, I think we need to get to Bladesinger as soon as possible now that we have our taunt secured. So whatever your reasons, we're taking wizard levels now. So, as a wizard, at level one, we get more spells, of course, cantrips and first level spells. Wizards have the most extensive spell list of any class, so there are, of course, a ton to choose from. I would just say that as a cantrip, I'd make sure to pick up Blade Ward at some point, but we're not gonna talk about it yet. Other than that, you will for sure want to get, of course, the shield spell, which lets you, as a reaction, when you get hit by an attack, cast this spell and raise your armor class by five until your next turn, potentially causing that attack and subsequent ones, for that matter, to miss. You should probably grab silvery barbs as well here i think as that can force an enemy to re-roll a saving throw or an attack that they make and take the lower roll and this could be really great if say you get hit by a critical and the shield spell is not going to help or even using it of course to protect an ally and, and hopefully help them not get hit speaking of wizard spells here's a question can you as an armorer cast spells with somatic or verbal components without the Warcaster feat if you are wearing your arcane armor. Now, artificer spells, sure, because your armor counts as a focus for your artificer spells, right? But what about wizard spells here? Obviously, this is something that you're gonna need to clear with your DM, and I strongly encourage you to do so before bringing this character to their table. But from everything I've read, I think most tables would say, yes, that's fine. While your gauntlets count as weapons, yes. And so on the one hand, someone might say, well, your hands are full. We're also told that they only count as weapons when they're not holding anything else, right? This implies that they could hold something else, like say, a spellcasting focus, and when they are, they would not count as weapons. And as we know, you can use the same hand to hold a spellcasting focus as you use to perform the somatic component of a spell. Now, I'm sure there are some DMs out there that would give you a hard time about this, but come on, guys. <laughs> I mean, if you have to at your table, you can take the Warcaster feat to make this work, but I think you should roll your eyes at your DM really hard every time you cast a spell. <laughs> anyway, 
We also, as a wizard at level 1, get Arcane Recovery, which lets us, once per day, after a short rest, recover spent spell slots equal to half of your wizard level rounded up, and you can't recover a spell slot higher than 5th level. Don't forget also that at this level, thanks to multiclassing that we've done with Artificer, we now have 2nd level spell slots, even though we're only a wizard 1. With Artificers, unlike other half-casters, you take half of their level and round up when trying to figure out your spell slot situation as per the multi-classing spell slot table, right? So currently we would be considered as having three levels of full caster, and that's nice. At level five, we would be a wizard two, and we get our arcane tradition, our wizard subclass. And of course we are going with blade singing. Here's something that we read about blade singers. Many who have observed a blade singer at work remember the display as one of the more beautiful experiences in their life. A glorious dance accompanied by a singing blade. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, hold on. So first off, as a blade singer, we get training in war and song. That gives us proficiency with light armor, which we already had, a single one-handed melee weapon, which we don't really need, and proficiency in the performance skill. Okay. I guess for the weapon proficiency, I would take rapiers so that we could dual wield them thanks to the dual wielder feat, right? If we lose our armor somehow, they are d8 weapons that are finesse weapons, so we could use our dexterity there. If we somehow lost our arcane armor, or maybe we find some really powerful magical swords, but of course, I think that those would probably be better off in the hands of another character in your party, most likely. But anyway, we also, of course, as a blade singer, get Blade Song, which tells us that so long as we are not wearing medium or heavy armor, so be sure to pick up some studded leather by this point and make that your arcane armor, right? Not scale mail anymore. And as long as we're not using a shield, hence why, again, dual wielder is so good for this build since we're prohibited from using a shield anyway and that's a potential plus two ac that we're missing out on we might as well get the plus one to ac from dual wielder and thus be able to make an extra attack with our bonus action when we're not using it otherwise to do more damage and potentially land another taunt right but so long as we meet all those requirements we can proficiency bonus times per day so three currently that should get most of us through most if not all of our combat encounters in a day i think we can use a bonus action to invoke our blade song which gives us the following benefits we gain a bonus to our armor class equal to our intelligence modifier which is a three for now 10 additional feet of move speed which is nice Advantage on acrobatics checks could be good, especially if we're going up against something trying to grapple us. And a bump to our concentration checks equal to our intelligence modifier as well. These are amazing benefits for any character really, but especially for someone like us who is trying to fill the role of a tank in their party and will always be concentrating on a spell to help them do so. Okay, let's pause for a moment here. Like I said, this is not a very typical image that I think most of us have when we think of a blade singer, right? Now, maybe I'm only speaking for myself here, but I think the typical blade singer for most of us is someone who's lightly armored, lithe, dexterous, not weighed down by what might potentially feel like heavy machinery in this techno armor suit, right? Just punching stuff and not swinging any blades. But I'm gonna be honest, the more time I've spent with this character, the more I love how different this feels to me. Like, instead of this long-haired, kind of elfy, dancer-like fighter who pirouettes and spins in battle, which, don't get me wrong, is also an image and archetype I love, this character might be a little more gritty, I think. Not that they have to be, necessarily, but maybe a little more Vi from Arcane slash League of Legends and a little less Legolas, right? I think you can absolutely still be dexterous and lithe, but more like a welterweight boxer, I think. Light on your feet, sure. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, right? And there's no reason why your arcane armor has to be a super steampunky, heavy mech suit, right? It's studded leather with leather gloves, maybe with spikes on them or brass knuckles. There might be a few sort of techy looking enhancements to it, but they can be subtle or none at all if you prefer. So now we're bobbing and weaving like a prize fighter. And the only thing singing here are our fists. 
and I love it. But in addition to that, I want to sort of tally up all of the benefits we got from going Artificer here instead of Fighter. First up, we get to use our intelligence both for our spellcasting stat and our attack stat, and it adds to our armor class as well. Yes, we still want dexterity, as I mentioned at the beginning, but having one stat to bump all three of those things is just phenomenal. Also, as I've mentioned, our spell slot progression isn't slowed nearly as much here as it would be by going fighter. So while we might not have the spells of a full fifth level blade singer at this point at least we have the spell slots of a fourth level one and that's pretty significant much better than where we'd be if we had gone fighter what's more even though we didn't get say the defensive fighting style to bump our armor class we got two infusions one of which gives that same plus one to ac benefit and a second that lets us add plus one to our attacks meaning we'll do a little more damage yes but also land that all important taunt with more consistency. Finally, while the Cavalier Fighter is nice in that they can similarly impose disadvantage on enemies they hit in a turn, they have a fairly significant drawback in that the debuff only works if the enemy is within five feet of you for Cavalier. So the enemy might decide to run after your ally who's 10 or 20 feet away from you on their turn and then just attack them without that disadvantage debuff. Sure, they might take an opportunity attack from you, but not if you use your reaction from shield or something and the enemy might decide that it's worth it anyway. Or you might really want to run around the battlefield yourself and hit a couple of different enemies to impose disadvantage on both of them, but they're not standing right next to each other, right? Cavalier is going to have to choose between one or the other sometimes, but the armor doesn't. They just have to punch something and the disadvantage sticks. All of that said, if this image of an artificer blade singer that's punching stuff just doesn't really work for you, then I think you could absolutely go fighter here for your Bladesinger tank. Like I've said, I don't think it works quite as well, but it's by no means unviable. So if your Bladesinger tank really just needs to be swinging an actual blade, go for it. I think you'd take the same dual wielder feet, grab defense or maybe even interception fighting style, which would be another great way to protect your allies, though at the cost of your reaction, of course, and focus dexterity first before intelligence, I think, as hitting your target again is going to be priority number one. I mean, action surge will be super nice to have you know there are some perks of going this route but anyway at level six we would be a wizard three and we get second level wizard spells i would say although i am a little sad to not be using shadow blade on this blade singer having our concentration freed up for things like fairy fire or even enlarge reduce to make ourselves a bigger and more imposing presence on the battlefield and or to like block off hallways and things so that our enemies can't really get past us is, is a really nice potential option or of course even you know hold person when you're fighting humanoids or web or blindness deafness or suggestion etc etc these are all great options that will whether directly or indirectly help protect our allies and keep them safe and then we do now have by the way, third level spell slots, thanks to our multi-classing, so that's great. All right, at level six, it is time for our first damage report. So let's review what our total potential armor class bonuses are here. We're getting plus three from our dexterity modifier. We're getting plus three from our intelligence modifier, assuming we've got Bladesong active. We're getting an additional two from studded leather, plus one for our enhanced defense infusion, plus one from the dual wielder feat, and then plus five potentially from the shield spell, giving us a total potential of a 25 AC at level six. That's kind of amazing. Our total potential hit points are going to be 51, but that includes the temporary hit points we can give ourselves as a bonus action three times per day uh, with our defensive field feature, right? So yes, we are very hard to hit, but we do not have a huge hit point pool. Let's see how we stack up. For those who don't know, for my tank builds, I always pit the character against a hypothetical boss encounter, a hypothetical sort of typical or average encounter, and then a fireball spell, just to see how much damage they would take per round on average if the enemies in that encounter all simply attacked them for an entire round. We call that number DTPR, or damage taken per round, and then I calculate how long we would survive at that rate of damage and call that RTD or rounds to die. So yes, I'm assuming that we have access to the shield spell. We won't always, of course, I get it. It's all very theoretical. It doesn't really replicate what an actual combat encounter in D&D is going to look like, but it's a serviceable model, I think, so long as we're consistent in its application to all of our theoretical tank characters. So 
at level six. The boss fight was a young white dragon, and if that dragon did nothing but try and bite and claw us on its turn, we would take on average eight damage per round, and at that rate of damage, we would survive for seven rounds. The typical fight was against four berserkers, and our DTPR there is three, and we'd survive for 19 rounds at that rate. And then a DC 14 level three fireball here would do 10 damage to us on average, and at that rate, we would survive for five rounds. Compared to other tank builds that I've done at this level, and in case you don't know, check the video description and you can see graphs and spreadsheets comparing tank builds to each other and stuff like that. We are doing better than most tanks against those berserkers, and we're kind of middle of the pack compared to others versus the boss fight and the fireball. So, okay, I'm feeling pretty good about ourselves, but I am super excited for what's coming. At level seven, we would be a wizard four, and we get our first ability score increase or feat, and I think we have to bump intelligence, taking it to an 18. Being sad makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, bumping intelligence improves our spell efficacy, our survivability, our concentration checks, and even our likelihood to apply our soft taunt and our DPR, our damage per round. So yeah, maxing it first is just a no-brainer, I think. At level eight, we would be a wizard five, and we get third level wizard spells. Keep in mind that the best way to keep your allies safe won't always be to make yourself more durable right, but will instead be to find other ways to control or deter your enemies. While imposing disadvantage on your enemies by punching them is great, sometimes, and maybe most of the time, incapacitating a group of them with hypnotic pattern or forcing six of them to have a lower armor class, choose between an action or a bonus action but not both, move at half speed, and not be able to take reactions, as well as make it more difficult for them to cast spells, all of that which comes via the slow spell, will do a much better job in the long run of actually protecting your allies, right? And thus, the beauty of a Gish tank, right? That said, the one spell that I'm going to highlight here, and that I'm going to plan on using for number crunching purposes, is haste. Haste is super potent. Now, you might think we'd be better off casting it on a big damage dealer in your party, and you might be right, but don't discount the power of casting it on ourselves, which would allow us to potentially impose disadvantage on four different targets all over the battlefield once we get extra attack, while doubling your move speed so you can actually get to all of those targets, and raising your armor class by two, which is what we would get from the haste spell. There is a big downside to it, of course, and it's that when the spell ends, even if we lose concentration in the middle of the fight, we sort of stun ourselves. We can't move or take reactions for the entire turn. Now, fortunately, our concentration checks are pretty solid thanks to our constitution save proficiency, as well as our blade song buff, but just beware, and sure, you know, take Warcaster if you're really worried about it, or maybe even the mind sharpener artificer infusion instead of probably the enhanced weapon I think, or maybe enhanced defense infusion. So yeah, I'm gonna assume we're using haste when I crunch the numbers, but again, like I said, it might not necessarily be the best way to protect your allies. I'm just trying to optimize for survivability here. Know your options. Don't forget, we also have fourth level spell slots here now, so we could potentially cast a third level spell three times in a day now, which is great. But then at level nine, we are a wizard six, and this is the promised land for our Bladesinger's survivability, and it makes me a little giddy. Because at wizard six, Bladesingers get extra attack, but of course, as most of you know, is super special. So we can attack twice with our fists using our action now, of course, or as a Bladesinger, we can replace one of those weapon attacks with a cantrip. Remember our little friend, Blade Ward? This little cantrip gives us resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage from weapon attacks. The big problem with it, of course, is that it usually takes an action to cast, forcing a tank like us to have to choose. Do we try and hit and thus taunt our enemies, or do we vastly increase our own survivability? Well, guess what? Bladesingers can do both. In, I think, every tank build that I've done to date, I've always wished that I could enjoy both the damage resistance benefit that barbarian tanks get while raging, and the shield, absorb elements, and other defensive buffs that casters who aren't raging get to take advantage of. 
And now we can have both of those things and it is glorious. And it's just in time for our next damage report at level nine. So since last time we checked, our armor class has gone up by two from haste, theoretically, and one from intelligence for a potential total of 28 AC. Our hit points have gone up to 72 if we include our temporary hit points, but above all, we can now potentially have resistance to all of the damage that I'm going to be calculating for because yes, in case you weren't sure, natural weapons like a dragon's bite or claws are considered weapon attacks, and so Blade Ward should grant us resistance. Our boss fight at level 9 was a young blue dragon, and against them, our damage taken per round is a teeny tiny 3. And at that rate of damage, we would survive for 24 rounds. The typical average fight was 4 hobgoblin captains, and if they all just attacked us for a round, our DTPR would again be 3. Our rounds to die would be 23. If you're curious about the discrepancy, it's because I'm rounding numbers here. And against a level five DC 15 fireball, we would take 14 damage on average, and at that rate, we would survive for six rounds. Those numbers are really good. We're still in the middle of the pack for that fireball compared to other tanks, but we are beating out every other tank I've ever done, except the abjuration wizard tank on the other two fights. And what can I say? Wizards are OP. At level 10, now that we have our extra attack, I think I'd want to go back to Artificer just for a second to grab that ability score increase that's just right there. And so yes, we could take that, bump our intelligence so that it's capped at 20, and that feels really nice. But then at level 11, I think we go back to Wizard, we'd be a Wizard 7, and I'm planning on sticking Wizard for the rest of this character's career. So as a Wizard 7, we would get fourth level spells, of course. Um, there are so many amazing ones to consider. Dimension Door, Polymorph, etc. You know them, you love them. The only one I'd say we should think about using in combat here for defensive purposes anyway, would be Fire Shield, actually. Fire Shield is an action to cast, but it lasts 10 minutes and it doesn't require a concentration. So if you know or feel fairly confident that you're going to be taking cold or fire damage in a fight, I would use it as it can grant you resistance to one or the other, depending on if you cast a warm shield or a cold shield. And the nice thing about that is that it would basically let you save your reaction. So you wouldn't have to use absorb elements ever, right? At least against fire or cold. And then you could always have that reaction available for, you know, silvery barbs or shield. It's just a nice arrow to have, I think, in your defensive bag of tricks quiver. And it also does have the nice benefit of returning damage to your melee attacker if they hit you, but let's be honest, you're almost never getting hit, right? We do also, of course, have fifth level spell slots as well, so keep that in mind. At level 12, we would be a wizard eight, and we get another ability score increase or feat. This is easy, right? We just bump dexterity. Mm, yeah, not so fast. Here's the thing. Our AC right now is ridiculously good. If, and I appreciate that this is a big if, we have both our reaction and a spell slot available for the shield spell, we can get our AC up to 29 right now. This means that anything with less than a plus 10 to hit can only hit us if they crit, if they roll a natural 20. Of course, there are enemies out there with a plus to hit that high, but it's not like they're incredibly common at this level. But on the other hand, our hit point pool is fairly abysmal. We have mostly been taking levels in a D6 character class, and we only have a 14 constitution. My biggest concern currently isn't so much facing a ton of enemies with a plus 10 to hit or higher, but it's what will happen to us when we do get crit, or of course when we fail a saving throw against a spell or a trap or something that does damage to us. To that end, I think the best way to improve our survivability at this point is to increase our hit point pool, and the most efficient way to do that is via the tough feat. Tough gives us plus two hit points per level, and that would mean 24 more hit points total for us right now, and that's a lot, and especially on a character who, thanks to both blade ward and absorb elements, is likely to be taking half damage on almost all incoming damage. 24 is almost like 48 hit points for us. It's a much needed and very welcome bump to our survivability. It's going to make us better against most situations when we're potentially taking damage. I was tempted to actually go this route even sooner, but considering all the benefits that we get from intelligence, I, I think we'd be crazy not to cap that first. But at this point, again, our survivability will generally be improved more from tough than by raising our AC by one via a dexterity bump. At level 13, 
we would be a wizard nine and we get fifth level spells. Ah, the joys of being a wizard. Trapping multiple enemies behind wall of force is probably going to do a lot more to protect your allies than raising your armor class by two via haste will, right? And let's not forget the beauty of synaptic static which would not only do fireball-esque damage, but also force any enemy who fails their intelligence save against the spell to reduce every attack they make by a d6, as well as their ability checks and concentration checks. Imagine throwing out synaptic static to start the fight and then imposing disadvantage on top of the minus d6 to every enemy that you smack. So good. Anyway, have fun with those fifth level spells. There's some fantastic ones. And we have sixth level spell slots now, so we've got lots of great slots with which to cast those really powerful fun spells. For our level 13 damage report, our armor class has gone up by one when we bumped our intelligence, so we're now at a potential of 29 with the shield spell. And our hit point pool has increased by quite a bit thanks to that tough feat for a total potential of 126 hit points if you include your temps. And those actually went up a smidge as well because we took that fourth level in Artificer. Our boss fight at this level is an adult white dragon, and if they did nothing but attack us during our turn, we would on average take four damage in a round, and at that rate, we would survive for 30 rounds. The typical fight was against five helmed horrors, and the DTPR there was also four. The rounds to die was 34, again, some discrepancy due to rounding, and against a DC 16 level seven fireball, we would take 17 damage per round on average. At that rate, we would survive for eight rounds. And so, yeah, we are comparing just as well across the board as last time to other tanks at this level, and we get to be a Bladesinger while we're at it. At level 14, we would be a Wizard 10, and Bladesingers get Song of Defense at this level. I have mixed feelings about this ability. With Song of Defense, when you take damage, you can use your reaction to spend a spell slot and reduce the amount of damage by five times the spell slot level that you spend. We already have a lot of demands on our reaction for defensive purposes with shield, absorb elements, and even silvery barbs. And this only works on the one thing that's doing damage to us, right? It doesn't persist until our next turn like shield would. So if we were to use it to avoid damage from, let's say a spell or maybe a critical hit where shield wouldn't help us at all, that's nice, but we might still have actually been better off saving our reaction for the shield spell if that spell that's doing damage to us happens at a point in the round when there are still multiple enemies that are going to go between now and our next turn and who might be attacking us, right? Because again, that plus five to AC lasts all the way until our next turn. The same can be said of Silvery Barbs, of course. Also, with Song of Defense, to really reduce a significant amount of damage, we'd have to expend a pretty high level spell slot. So using this, I think, is advisable only in extreme circumstances, in my opinion, like if the damage would otherwise knock you unconscious or something. Still, I won't complain about having a, an additional defensive option. At level 15, we'd be a wizard 11, and we get sixth level spells. Of course, there are a ton of amazing ones to consider. I mean, Mass Suggestion is going to do wonders to protect your allies by just, well, making your enemies fight each other if your DM would allow that at your table, or at the very least, I think, just have a ton of your enemies just leave the battlefield on a failed save. And it doesn't even require concentration. Aside from Mass Suggestion, the one that I'll mention specifically here and say that I'm going to assume that we're using it for our concentration going forward is the new spell that we got from Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons, Fizzband's Platinum Shield. Oh, how I love this spell for this build. So first up, it only requires a bonus action to cast, which is really nice. But then when we cast it, we can choose a creature within 60 feet, including ourselves, and that creature is then surrounded by a silvery light and gains the following benefits. They get half cover, which means a plus two to armor class, and thus, for all intents and purposes, the same benefit as haste, unless your enemy can ignore cover for some reason. They automatically have resistance to all elemental damage, so no more need for absorb elements or even fire shield if you were using that occasionally. And they have evasion, meaning that if you need to make a dexterity save to take half damage on something. If you fail the save, you only take half damage, and if you succeed on the save, you take no damage. 
that's fantastic. And the best part, I think, is that on subsequent turns, you can use your bonus action to move the shield to somebody else or from an ally to yourself or vice versa. That can be really great if you've got an, an ally in dire straits or and or if you're having a hard time convincing the enemies to attack you for whatever reason. The spell is amazing. It's really going to improve our survivability when I crunch the numbers against those dex based spells, especially, but it comes with the added benefits of a bonus action to cast, not causing you to be stunned if you drop concentration, and being able to move it to an ally. Giving up the move speed and the extra attack features that we get from haste is a bummer, no question, but I think it worth the trade-off, and again I'm going to assume that we're using it going forward when I crunch the numbers. As long as we have the spell slots to cast it, of course, and of course we do have a 7th level spell slot now thanks to multiclassing. So I mean, we could cast Platinum Shield for at least 2 combats per day if we wanted. At level 16, we would be a wizard 12, and we get another ability score increase or feat. At this point, enemies with huge plus to hit bonuses are becoming more and more common, I think, and while bumping our constitution would give us some additional hit points, it's not as many hit points as the tough feat gave us, of course, so I do think that dexterity has a slight edge here for a lot of encounters, especially since it will also increase our initiative as well as our dexterity saving throws, which are both fairly important. But there's not really necessarily a super clear-cut winner here for survivability purposes, so feel free to bump your constitution institution here if you prefer, or of course, you know, resilient wisdom to bolster your wisdom save, which becomes really important if and when you run into high level spellcasters, but I'm going to assume that we're taking decks. And then finally for us at level 17, we would be a wizard 13 and we get seventh level wizard spells. Too many amazing ones to name, but I think you probably have to at least take Force Cage here, as it can potentially lock down multiple enemies and do so without concentration even, so you could still concentrate on whether it's Fizz Bands or some other control spell. And then we do have an 8th level spell slot now. Lots and lots of spell slots. So fun. But for our final damage report then, at level 17, our armor class has gone up by one more thanks to our dex bump to a potential total of 30. When we have the shield spell active, our potential hit points, including temporary hit points, has increased to 162. And we've also gained evasion thanks to platinum shield for those pesky dex based spell attacks. Just in time too, since at this level, we are no longer dealing with fireball spells anymore, but a DC 17 meteor swarm. The boss fight is going to be an adult red dragon, and our DTPR against them would be 8. At that rate of damage, we would survive for 21 rounds. The typical fight was 5 earth elementals, and if they were all just punching us for an entire round, we'd take 6 damage on average and survive for 29 rounds at that rate, and then that meteor swarm on average would do 32 damage to us because we're only getting resistance to half of it right with meteor swarm half is fire and half is bludgeoning but at that rate of damage we would survive for six rounds so we are actually now better on the survivability charts than almost every other tank for all three encounters and that is freaking amazing considering everything else we can potentially bring to the table in the form of control utility and other wizardly goodness one thing too that I'll, that's fun about meteor swarm in particular you could if you had your reaction available and fizz bands active on yourself reduce the average damage that you take from a meteor swarm to zero or almost zero if if you spent a sixth level spell slot or higher for song of defense even if you failed your dexterity save it would be pretty fun to be like meteor swarm meh if i make my save i take no damage oh i failed my save meh I still take zero damage. One last thing that I'll note here before final thoughts. If you do get to play this character at this level, at high level like this, then I'm super jealous. But also, at the very next level, we would be a Bladesinger 14 and we would get to double our intelligence modifier on any attacks that we land, thanks to the Bladesinger's Song of Victory. So that's plus 10 damage flat to every single hit, making this character deal some pretty fantastic sustainable DPR, especially for a tank, especially if you had haste on yourself. And so, final thoughts. Of course I love this character. Of course it's going to be the very next character I play when I decide to play a tank. <laughs> How could you not, right? I mean, they're a bladesinger, but also they're basically a monk bladesinger. Like the thing that I love the most about monks is the whole concept of like, my body is the only weapon I need. And 
Even though, sure, this character is technically making attacks with weapons, in game at least, I think it would absolutely look and feel like you are just a magical martial artist extraordinaire, I think. Light on your feet, expertly dodging and deflecting, and then just pummeling your enemies with some pretty decent damage, but more importantly, with that debuff to keep your allies safe. And I mean, of course, the truth is the most powerful thing about this character is that they get wizard spells. So you just get to do it all. Protect your allies, do decent damage, throw out the best control and even area of effect damage spells in the game if you want to. And I mean, I guess I kind of just answered my own question that I asked at the beginning, right? Why do we love Gishas so much? Because we want to do everything and do it well. And with this character especially, I feel like we can. So that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I loved putting it together. I can't wait to play it in game someday. Know that I love you. And thank you so much for watching and for subscribing and liking and all the things that you do to support the channel. I truly, truly appreciate it. I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope that you'll check out the other content on the channel if there's stuff that you haven't seen yet or that you're curious about. But I hope you have a great week and I hope to see you again really soon. Till then, be good, be kind, be happy, stay safe. Bye. We don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. We don't talk about Bruno. Come on, burp. <laughs> Sorry. Well, don't even say that. Don't even say that. Don't say that. Of course we're taking Misty Step. Everybody takes Misty Step. Take Misty Step. <laughs> and I already said that, so don't say that. How do I say that? Well, don't say that. Well, don't even say that, because, uh, yeah. More planes. Everybody should be concerned about survivability. Don't say that. Well, uh, don't say that. And doing, and, well, don't, I mean, don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Dvd dvd Bruno. Da da ba da ba da Bruno, bidi 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 Bruno, bidi 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 Bruno. <laughs> Make it stop, please. I have two young girls at home, and Encanto is an excellent movie, and that's a pretty good song. But man, is it a brain worm.